Hello and welcome to the second lecture of week seven. Today we are going to be focusing on the Roman East and I'm just going to warn you in advance, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind of a lecture. We are going to be going across different geographies, different cities, um, and it might feel like a lot to take in. So I uh, just while you're watching this, I know there's going to be a lot of sites and a lot of names, but I really want you to think about overall general um, themes, what are we seeing across colonies, what are we seeing as general trends. So really try to keep that in mind, um, because that's going to be more important than the actual specifics of every single site. Um, and like I said, uh, there are going to be many, many sites, and that is just because I wanted to give you a good overview of all of the different places in the Roman East. So it's going to be a bit of a monster of a lecture, but bear with me. Um, the other thing that you might notice is that the, the dates are a bit all over the place. So we're going to start with Hadrian, and a lot of what we look at will be Hadrianic construction as kind of a continuation from our last lecture, um, but not all of it will be because this was the Roman East was being built up under multiple emperors over time. So make sure to pay attention to the dates because this is not all Hadrianic, but a lot of it is. So uh, speaking of Hadrian, we're going to get started with him. So I wanted to show you again his portrait. Uh, this is the townly Hadrian that we talked about last time, and we know it's Hadrian because he has that beard. He's the first emperor that we've had um, who has a beard, and this is a reference to his love of Greece, right? The fact that he's a Hellenophile. He loves Greek culture. And I think I mentioned in the last lecture that the beard is a reference to Greece because of these philosopher statues that we see. Um, busts like the ones on the left where they have the, all these beards. The beards were a common style of Greek philosophers back in antiquity, even before the Romans. So that's what we see a little bit of a reference here, but you'll notice that the philosopher beards are a bit unruly, they're kind of unkempt, uh, where Hadrian keeps his a little bit neater, and that might be more of a reference to someone like Pericles, who was a Greek leader. He was the leader of Athens. He, he created the uh, Periclean building program, which is the Acropolis, so all of the buildings that we know on the Acropolis were built under him and he was a very strong leader of Athens in its heyday. So Pericles, as you can see, also has the beard like the philosophers, but his is a bit more trimmed. Uh, it looks more of a, a military, you know, um, kept beard. Uh, and that's kind of what we see on Hadrian. So Hadrian might be trying to connect himself more to Greek rulers than Greek philosophers. Uh, moving forward with Hadrian, and also speaking of Athens, that is where we left off last time. So we left off with the Arch of Hadrian, uh, which, as you'll remember, has those two sides to it. And I think I mentioned that it was part of a wall. It actually, that was incorrect. So it's not, it wasn't part of a wall, but it was on a road. So it was on a road that kind of goes into the heart of the city. So it was a, a gate that people would walk through. And on one side, you had the Olympeion, which is the temple to uh, Zeus, Jupiter, uh, that Hadrian finally finished after centuries of it being unfinished. Uh, Hadrian finally finished that, and that quarter kind of became a, a Hadrianic city. Um, and so that side, you see the inscription that says, this is the city of Hadrian and not of Theseus, which is a direct contrast to the older part of Athens, uh, which we see on the other side of the gate saying, this is Athens, the ancient city of Theseus. So we see a bit of the old and the new, and we see a reclaiming of Athens that Hadrian is going to do. He's going to adopt the city uh, for himself and almost create this new Athens. Part of this also comes uh, in the other part, kind of the main older part of that city. So although that's still the, <laughs> the ancient city of Theseus, we do definitely see Hadrian's footprint there. So we were over here at the Arch of Hadrian, kind of on the side of the Acropolis here, uh, over in New Athens, but in the heart of Old Athens, uh, we also see some Hadrianic building programs. So we're going to look at those in more detail. Uh, the first is the Roman Agora. So the Roman Agora was not Hadrianic to begin with. It was built under the reign of Julius Caesar, I believe, and so it was a little bit older, but Hadrian came in and made some updates. So an agora is essentially a Greek forum. It's the, the, the version of a forum in Greece. So it's the downtown area. It's that mix of commercial, religious, civic buildings, all of these things kind of in one place. We have the classical agora, which was created under the, in the classical period. And that's what you see on this plan. So that's where the Hephaestion is. Uh, there's a lot of stoas, temples. That's kind of the old heart of the city. But the Romans, like I said, under Julius Caesar, are going to build the Roman Agora, which is an extension of that. So if we are um, in the Agora and then we walk through this little street here. So there's a big stoa. And then we're going to walk down this street. And that'll lead us into this. 
So you can kind of, I don't know, you can maybe kind of try to follow it. Um, this is the plan of the Roman Agora. It was uh, basically square in shape and also uh, largely commercial space. So there was uh, essentially a marketplace kind of stalls and things in there. Uh, we see colonnades, some of which are still left today. We also see the gate Athena Archegetis, which is marking the entrance to the Roman Agora. So if we are coming from the classical Agora over here, um, and we've walked through that little alleyway that I showed you, we're going to walk down this street and we're going to be met by this arch gateway, and that's going to be the entrance into the Roman Agora. The gate was actually built um, also under Augustus, so it is kind of dedicated to him, associated with him, but we see nearby, just on the inside of it, so that's this kind of pillar right here, um, that is what we're seeing here, uh, a decree from Hadrian. So it's a decree from Hadrian, you can, there's an inscription on it, and the decree talks about, it's regulating the sale of olive oil, it's saying that uh, olive oil, oil sellers are, are going to be required to, to give a tax to the city so that the city always has a fair price um, on olive oil. But it's located right there, and so we definitely see Hadrian making his mark. Um, and there's, there's, uh, he refers to himself as kind of a lawmaker, a lawmaker Hadrian, as a reference to the fact again that he is, he is seeing himself as the new adopter of this city. That this is now his city, and so he's, he's making laws, he's determining things, um, definitely making his mark. So we were, um, like I said, so here's the classical agora. We walked through that little alleyway. There was the gate. Um, I wanted to also mention, that's right, that it's in the Doric order. Um, and so this is more of a Greek style. Um, it's also on the Western side. And then there would have been an Ionic order gate on the Eastern side of the Roman agora. But it's pretty, um, it's a bit simpler. It's not as lavish as we might see in the, in the heart of Rome. Um, a little bit simpler, less decoration on it. So as I said, that's right here, that's on that road from coming from the classical agora. And then if we go on the other side of the Roman agora, we're coming to something in quotations that we call the Pantheon. And this was a building built by Hadrian. And so it's, we call it Hadrian's Pantheon, but similar to the Pantheon that he built in Rome, right? Uh, we're not sure if it was actually a, a temple for worship of the Pantheon in the traditional sense of what a temple is. Uh, but it seems like it was also, like I said, similar to the Pantheon in Rome, kind of a place to hold court, um, a bit of a civic structure. Um, Hadrian had this, this vision of a, of a Panhellenic gathering. He was very interested in Greece and wanted to bring all of these different uh, cities in, in Greece together. So you might also hear it referred to as a Panhellion, as, a, as a, a gathering place for representatives, people from all parts of Greece to come together and meet. Um, because that was really his vision. He wanted this unified type of, of Greek culture. Um, so we see that taking place in his pantheon. Um, so it's technically dedicated to all the gods, but also used as a gathering place for all of Greece. And as I said, that's on the other side of the Roman Agora. So we see that over here. If we keep going though, so that's uh, down here, and then we're going to go across this street to the Library of Hadrian. This is perhaps the most iconic, most noticeable, um, biggest work of Hadrianic construction um, after the Olympion, but uh, the Library of Hadrian, um, as I said, right across from the Roman Agora, uh, and it was a library, so it was, it was built to hold books, it was kind of a, um, a gathering place. Um, we see that there is an entryway here with a, a colonnaded facade, um, and these columns are interesting because they're not quite freestanding, but they're not quite engaged, so they're attached um, just at the top here, just at the capitals, uh, so freestanding here and then attached by their capitals. Um, there are columns on all sides, and it's kind of similar to a forum in that it was a gathering space, so it was meant to hang out, uh, talk, you know, discuss things, uh, meet people, all of that. Um, but we, like I said, it did hold uh, tons and tons of scrolls and books. Uh, there might have been a central pool, so that's this area here, that would have been kind of like a fountain pool. Um, and like I said, there was lots of side rooms that you could kind of hang out in. So kind of like a library now, um, you know, if you think of, of shields or something, there's rooms that I think you can reserve, right, to study in or, and you can get it together in groups and have study groups. Uh, almost a similar thing, you can go off in these side rooms at Hadrian's library and, you know, discuss the, the scroll that you just read. Um, uh, just a, a note about the Library of Hadrian is that it's going to be destroyed around the third century and a church uh, will be built on its, on its spot and then it will be, remain a church actually for 
uh, centuries and centuries until it becomes an archaeological site like you see today. So I recommend if you're in Athens visiting it because there's a lot of ruins there, um, as well as at the Roman Agora, especially the classical Agora, there's a lot to see there. So uh, although we think of Athens as maybe, you know, just existing in the classical era, um, there's a lot of later history to it, especially in the Roman period and beyond. Um, like I said, we even see Christian churches after the fact, so lots to see in Athens besides its classical history. So that's going to do it for Greece. I want to mention um, that although we just looked at Athens, there were other thriving centers in Greece. Um, most notably, Corinth was also a thriving city under the Romans. Um, and that's located just south of Athens on the Peloponnese. Um, and so we see a lot of commerce, especially uh, Corinth had a major harbor that was a great kind of go-between between, between Italy, between Rome, and uh, the, the further east, like in Asia Minor. So Corinth, also very important in the Roman period. But we're going to turn now to Turkey, just because we have so much to look at. Um, so here is modern day Turkey um, called Asia Minor, also Anatolia. You kind of hear all of these different names for this part. Um, and we're going to be looking at a few cities there, but just to situate you, modern day Istanbul is going to be up here. And this is the western coast. And as I think I've said multiple times, the, the western coast of Turkey in antiquity was not seen as really part of the rest of Asia Minor, but it was much more related to the Greek world. So this, this western coast of Turkey was very closely associated um, with Greek culture, uh, more so than what we see on the eastern side of Asia Minor. The first city that we're going to start with is Ephesus. So um, if we're looking, oops, uh, here we go, right here. It's kind of on the coast. Um, also, you know, considered part of Greek, uh, the Greek East. Uh, Ephesus was um, a pretty large city, though. Um, like it, similar to Corinth, it was also uh, had a, had a big harbor, so it was a big shipping port, uh, and that was where it got a lot of its wealth from. Um, we see a few um, different time periods of Roman construction. So uh, there was a temple to the Flavians, right, built by Domitian, which we already looked at actually. That was where his Colossus was, um, and in even. Before that, in the you know more classical era, we see a temple to Artemis, um, and this was kind of a, a wonder of the world. It was a massive temple, and it would bring people to visit it. Um, but this is actually the temple of Artemis is not exactly in the Roman city, so the Roman city is a little bit uh, removed from the ancient Greek city. Um, the thing that you see right away in this image of the city is its massive theater. So this huge theater, which was constructed in the Roman period, and it really speaks to the wealth of Ephesus, the fact that they could build this massive structure, and also the population size. The fact that they would need a structure that could hold this many people speaks to how big of a city they had. So a well-populated and wealthy city in the Roman period. If we look the opposite direction, so on that same street, uh, we see again this wide avenue that goes through really the heart of Ephesus, and this is going to become a uh, a hallmark trait of, of especially Eastern Roman provinces are these colonnaded streets that we really start to see uh, broad avenues like this lined with colonnades, lined with columns. Um, it, as kind of the central street of the city. This is something very uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Roman Empire, not as much seen in, in Italy or in the West. Um, and so we'll look at a couple examples of that, but Ephesus is a great one. Although there's not many standing today, you can see the way that columns like these here or these here would have lined this street. We're gonna move now to the back and the Library of Celsus. So this is also in Ephesus, as I said, uh, around 117. So that should clue you in that we are looking at a, um, a building of Hadrianic construction um, because he was in power from 117 to 138. So this is right in the beginning of Hadrian's rule. Um, although we call it a, a library, it was also a tomb and a mausoleum for uh, Celsus, the, uh, the man mentioned in the beginning. Um, and his resting place is going to be in an apse in the back. So this is the facade. And then if you walk further down, you'll see an apse, which is kind of a rounded end to a building. Um, and that's where Celsus is going to uh, be buried. It was built by his son. And it's a great example of something that we call the Roman Baroque. And the Baroque is a term that we used when we were talking about Hellenistic sculpture. And that's very dramatic, ornate, over the top. Um, and that's what we're seeing, um, very expressive architecture and in sculpture, very expressive sculpture. So that's what we're seeing here um, is very ornate, um, dramatic architecture. 
This is something called a, a skenographic, skenographic, S-C-A-E-N-O-G-R-A-P-H-I-C. <laughs> I should have put it on the screen, sorry about that. Um, but it's kind of similar to a skene fronds, right, that we see in theaters, that backdrop. It's a similar thing where it's a multi-tiered um, facade, and it's going to be filled with these niches that are going to hold sculptures, um, like statues of prominent figures. Um, and so it's actually, the, the term scenographic is also associated with theater architecture. So um, the fact that I said Baroque uh, architecture is very expressive, over the top, dramatic, it kind of makes sense because there's a theatrical element to it, that this is very theatrical architecture. Um, and the library, this uh, building is also, as I said earlier, you saw in the picture, located at the opposite end of that street from the theater. So there's a bit of a connection there and that at one end of the street is this ornate kind of, uh, you know, stage-like structure. And then on the other side is the massive theater, you know, where kind of these are two views of the same street. But although it was a tomb, it was also a library, and so it also would have held books and scrolls, and the statues that we see in the scenographic uh, would have been personifications of virtues, so kind of related to scholarly pursuits, um, things that relate to, to the scholarly insight, you know, of the world, uh, uh, virtues that you might possess as an intellectual. Um, and it too also would have had reading rooms like the Library of Hadrian in Athens. So um, heavily ornamented and, and a decorative place for, for intellectuals to hang out. Um, and here's what it would have looked like in its heyday. So it would have been painted as all of these things that we're looking at, any kind of sculpture in the Roman world would have been. You can see those, those statues, how they would have been so visible and how, again, theatrical this would have been, very expressive architecture. Um, that we also refer to as Baroque, Baroque architecture. As I said, this was built under Hadrian. We also see a temple of Hadrian in Ephesus, also built during his reign. This is going to be built at the end of his reign, so he dies in 138, so we know it was built in those last few years, um, and it was actually created for the worship of Hadrian in his lifetime. And I know we've talked a lot about this, the idea of the emperor as part of the divine. We talked about it with Augustus, that he would hint at it. Then we talked about it with Domitian, where he came right out and said he is Lord and God. And here we see it with Hadrian, but we don't see Hadrian um, uh, declaring himself as a god. What we see are people in a province building a structure to him. Um, and that's a little bit similar to, I think we talked about that there was a cult of Augustus set up in Pompeii, similar to that, where that was during his lifetime, but it wasn't something he was going to the people and saying, you must worship me. It was sort of something they did on their own um, because they, you know, he had heavily implied that he was divine. And so it makes sense that they would have thought that. Um, so this is going to be a similar thing where it's um, a temple put up by the people of Ephesus for Hadrian. Uh, perhaps it was because he traveled so much and so he likely came to Ephesus. We know that he went to Athens three times, so it's likely that he came to Ephesus multiple times. Um, and so perhaps this was put up for him in honor of his visit so that when he visited, he could see this temple that the people had built for him and kind of a way to, to gain favor with the emperor, present him with a gift. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that the Arch of Hadrian on that that gate between the Olympeion and the old city was also a gift that he did not put up himself. That was the people of Athens putting that up. And that's what we see here as well. Uh, uh, something funded and constructed by the people of that city. Um, we do see a little bit of difference here, though. I hope you've already noticed from traditional Roman temples. So this is not the type of temple that may have been seen in the center of Rome. It actually looks much more Assyrian, so it looks more Eastern. Um, this this uh, triangular pediment, you can't really see it anymore, but it would have been um, a triangular pediment, but then we have this arch in the middle. Um, so that's, that, that's the, the Assyrian part, is putting that arch in the middle of a triangular pediment. It also would have has two pilasters and two columns. So there's four things in the front, but two of them are columns. So this is going to be a column, that's going to be a column, and then two of them are pilasters. So these ones are squared off. So it's not the typical all the way around or all the way at the front um, round columns. We have two pilasters, two columns. Um, also, though, this would have been not a huge temple, so it kind of just would have been something on the side of the road. Um, they're not making the hymn their main deity. It's kind of just a minor, a minor structure on the side of the road in Ephesus. Again, maybe to, if it, since it is on a roadway, maybe intended for Hadrian to see. 
uh, going to a different city in Turkey, so Aphrodisias, uh, named for Aphrodite. Uh, Aphrodisias, again, another ancient city that was redone in the Roman period. Um, it was actually the capital of the province in that area, so it was a pretty significant city. Um, and it really did prosper in the imperial uh, period of Rome in the first and second century CE. Population was probably around 10,000 people, um, which is a pretty good sized town, not, not massive, but fairly good size. Um, what we see here is the Sebastian, so that might sound familiar also because the temple of the Sebastoi that uh, Domitian had built for the Flavians, right? Uh, so again, related to worship of the emperor. Anytime that you see a Sebastian, something like that, it's going to be related to emperor worship. This one was dedicated to the Caesars and Julio-Claudian, so Julius Caesar and the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Um, it was built in the first century, so not Hadrianic. This is, this is much earlier, around 20 to 60 CE. And it was paid for by local families. So like I said, with the Temple of Hadrian, this is not an imperial piece of construction. This is something that the people in the city put up funds for. And in this case, it was actually private families, two prominent families. Uh, what we see here is a three-story building. So we have three stories and each one kind of has a, a portico type um, a colonnade around it with engaged columns. Uh, so not like a real, not a real portico. Um, on the bottom, we do see that, you know, portico is, is a porch, right? So this is kind of that, that overhanging portico. And then here it's kind of mimicking the bottom, but it's filled in with sculpture. So it's not, you can't actually walk there, it's, it's filled in. Um, each level, like the uh, Colosseum that we saw, has a different column order. Uh, so again, that is known as superimposed order. We have superimposed order happening here, and that we have actually the exact same. So we have Doric on the bottom, we have uh, Ionic in the middle, and then uh, Corinthian on the top. So again, that progression from Doric to Corinthian. It is decorated, as I said, uh, with many, many relief panels, and so we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at those. Uh, so today they're in a museum. So uh, just to give you a sense though of how many we have, uh, we have a lot that are well-preserved and there were a lot that decorated the building in general. So um, the subject matter mainly revolved around uh, kind of the intersection of history and myth. So um, lots of different scenes of both mythic heroes, but also emperors doing very heroic things. So they're kind of blurring those lines there and that they're making emperors uh, into heroic mythic figures, um, but they're, they're again blurring that line between myth and, and history. Um, so there's scenes of uh, different nations and tribes also, so we see references to different parts of the empire, like you see in the middle, we have Claudius conquering Britain, Britannia, and she, uh, you know, Britain is, is personified as a woman here, um, as kind of this, this enemy captive woman that he is fighting, um, that is a representation of Britain and the conquest of Britain. Um, over here, we see Augustus and a personification of victory, and we also might see, you know, we're used to seeing these kind of images of, of enemies now, bound captives. We see also a, an eagle, which was a symbol of Augustus, but then over here we have Aeneas fleeing Troy, Troy and Aeneas is a mythic hero, so uh, not a historical figure, although they may have thought he was a historical figure. And so to them, this is sort of all part of the national uh, memory, the, the history of Rome, um, and we're celebrating that here. Um, and so also we might see uh, the inclusion of Troy as a reference to the local, right? Because Troy is located on that Western, um, uh, coast of Turkey. And so uh, the fact that they're including Troy here might be a little bit more relevant to them, that they're trying to create a connection between their own location in Asia Minor with uh, Rome, because Aeneas was originally from Troy, but then he, he goes to Italy to essentially uh, found what will later become Rome. So we see some, some connections being made here between uh, the imperial center and the provinces. Uh, again, so we're, we're moving towns again. So now we're in, we are in Sagalassos, uh, Turkey again. Um, and this is a Harun. So this is a, uh, a temple for a hero. We talked about a Harun. We saw one in the Forum Boarium. Uh, so a temple to a hero. It's made of limestone. This is also uh, from the Augustan period. So probably the early first century, I think. Um, and what do we see here? So we don't see uh, depictions of any imperial figures here. 
um, what we actually see is um, a very dynamic kind of joyous scene. So we see 13 dancing female maidens. So those are the women that you see here, um, carved in really high relief that they're, they're really coming out of the Haroon of the frieze. Um, there's lots of depth to them. They're done in a very classical style. So you can see that elaborate drapery, right? The way that the, the, the garment moves with them to kind of indicate movement, to indicate that they're dancing. These aren't static figures, they are, they're moving and they're also all connected. So they are all holding this garment that, that the other one is next to them is also holding. So we see a lot of connection and a lot of movement. It's a very dynamic scene. Going along with the fact that it is um, a classically inspired uh, um, phrase, you can also see the shape of the bodies, right? So we have this naturalistic movement, but also we can actually see the physical form of the body underneath the drapery, which is something very classical. So for instance, you can see the shape of her leg coming out here, you can see the shape of her hip there, um, and so on. So uh, a, a bit classically inspired. Um, we also see more scenes of kind of uh, dancing or revelry. So here we have someone holding a lyre, so holding a musical instrument. Um, so this is probably, um, as I said, it's related to, to hero worship, and it may have even been associated with a, um, a local hero, um, someone who was kind of venerated in that area, maybe even someone who existed. Um, we're not sure. We did have on uh, nearby uh, the head of a, of a young man, that the st statue head of a young man. So maybe that is the one who this was actually dedicated to. We're not really sure. Um, it's also possible that this scene of dancing and revelry could be Dionysian. So um, if you remember from the, um, uh, the room that we saw at Pompeii, right? Uh, this Dionysian cult was definitely a thing that we see in different parts of the empire and often associated with music and dancing because he was kind of the god of revelry, of wine, all of these things. Um, so it could also be a Dionysian monument. We're kind of not sure. Um, but something just to note, I guess, is that, we, yeah, we don't see any imperial influence here. We don't see any depictions of emperors. We don't see any reference to history. This isn't a propaganda monument, and that's kind of rare in Rome. Everything else that we've seen so far, uh, a lot of propaganda, a lot of, uh, you know, the imperial hand kind of controlling how things are depicted. And here we are seeing more um, provincial art in the sense that there's no references to the empire here. This is, this is a more local um, scene. And also kind of just not as serious either. Um, we're, having a, we're having kind of a better time out here. We're kind of just in the provinces having a good time. <laughs> uh, yet another place in Turkey, Zugma. This, like many others that we've looked at, did not originate in the Roman period. So it was originally a Hellenistic city, uh, but it was taken over by the Romans, renamed. Its name means crossing point which is essentially what it was. It was a big trade center. It was also a port, a harbor city, and it was one of the last Roman ports before you got into the Persian world and the Persians controlled what was to the east of Asia Minor um, out in like modern day Iran. So um, this was the last Roman port before uh, the Persian empire. So it was a very wealthy city as we see a lot of these port cities um, are, you know, like we saw at Ephesus um, and Corinth I mentioned we see lots of also nice villas, so big mansions. Um, and that's where we see these mosaics that we're looking at here. Um, very elaborate and really well preserved and just honestly beautiful mosaics. Um, you can see that the, by the size and the quality and the intricacy that they were owned by, by very wealthy people. This was definitely a wealthy um, commission, something for a lavish villa. Um, and there's a lot of maritime imagery, which might make sense because again, we're on the water. So we're kind of referencing the local environment here. Um, so a couple things that we see, we see lots of scenes from myth. So that's what I've, I've pointed out here. Um, on the bottom, we have Pasiphae and Daedalus. Um, that's in this lower scene, a scene from myth. And then up here we have Achilles on Skiros, um, also a scene from, from myth. So lots of, um, uh, a movement in these scenes. We see lots of, again, dynamic movement. You can tell that the figures are in motion by their kind of complex poses and um, the way that the drapery is, is kind of swaying, you know, especially if you look down here or over here, they've been able to recreate this sort of classical drapery in a mosaic. So it's not sculpture, it's mosaic, um, which is, you know, glass tile that we've, we've placed into a design, colored glass that we've made a design out of. 
Um, but very, uh, in a way it's pretty, it's, it's maybe not as naturalistic or, um, uh, you know, uh, it's not as naturalistic as a sculpture might be, um, just because of the medium. It's a bit harder to do that on a, on a flat surface, on a two-dimensional surface, but it's pretty good. Um, it looks pretty naturalistic. Um, and again, that sense of movement, and we really have a scene taking place here. Um, we even have inscriptions, as you can see, um, in Greek. So um, there's a narrative at play here, similar to a uh, fourth style wall painting, in the sense that we had those uh, big panels, and then we would have that scene in the middle, um, sort of a similar trope here, um, where we have one scene from myth being depicted in this central image, and then we have a border of kind of geometric designs. Um, so similar themes, similar styles across different media. All right, so moving through our whirlwind tour, um, we're going to be coming out of, of Anatolia, of, of Turkey. Um, and so just to, to kind of remind you where we were, that's this area here. Um, and then the, the Parthians and Persia, that's what I was mentioning, is going to be to the east here. And they're going to control that section. And then um, this modern day Armenia is kind of, uh, kind of goes back and forth. It's kind of always being fought over. Um, but we're going to go continuing in the Roman Empire. We're going to start going down into the Middle East um, around, along the, the coast here in the Levant. And so this area, I've kind of, we've enlarged it here um, so that you can see it a little bit closer and um, some of the cities that would have existed in the Roman period. So, and you can see what we were just looking at, Zugma is located here. And so it's actually on the Euphrates. It's not on a, a sea, it's on a, a river. So it's on the Euphrates River and kind of one of those last uh, places before you get into Persian territory. And you can see um, it's not actually on the map, but it would have been a route about that area, somewhere around there. So um, kind of on that border. But as I said, we're going to be going now into the Levant. So we're going to start with Caesarea Maritima. Uh, this is in modern day Israel, um, what was then called Judea. It too was on the water, so another harbor town, um, very important for Roman shipping, for Roman trade. Um, and it features a man-made harbor made of concrete. Uh, so that was kind of a, a cool feat, the fact that they can pour concrete underwater and it will set underwater. So they can create a man-made harbor out of concrete. Yet another use of concrete, another display of Roman engineering. Um, it was built around 15 BC by King Herod, so thus it is the Herodian harbor. Uh, and definitely has influence from Julio Claudians, though. Um, it is named for Caesar, obviously, um, so closely connected to them. And it was also modeled on Hellenistic harbors. So uh, the sense that we have a lighthouse, we have the, uh, not much exists anymore, but we've done archaeology and the, we know that there was a lighthouse there. Uh, there was a famous lighthouse at Alexandria built during the Hellenistic period. And so we see uh, uh, them taking inspiration from that, kind of incorporating that design into their own harbor here. Um, and like I said, uh, a very wealthy port as well. So that's why we see this massive harbor that they can build. The engineering that they can undertake is all because of the wealth of this port city. If we continue though, also in Judea, so this is pretty early, as I said, 15 BC. Um, but later on, Hadrian has quite a large role in Judea. And so we mentioned uh, in the Flavian lecture, we talked about Titus and Vespasian going into Judea and conquering the, uh, the Jews there. Uh, there's the battle at Masada, right? And so we talked about that, and this is an ongoing issue, this ongoing conflict between the Romans and the Jews. Although the Romans had had that victory, you know, and they really celebrated that victory in Rome, as we saw in a lot of their art and architecture, uh, problems continued. There are actually three Jewish wars that take place between the Romans and the Jews around this time period. So Hadrian, um, his rule was right around the third one. Um, and what happens is uh, Hadrian visits Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, which is a really sacred space in Jewish religion and Jewish culture, um, the Temple Mount in, in Jerusalem, the temple that had been there had been destroyed in 70 CE when Titus had taken over the city, taken over the region. Um, so the temple was destroyed in 70. Uh, Hadrian comes and visits the city of Jerusalem and pledges to the people that he's going to rebuild the temple. Uh, but what he means is, is that he's going to rebuild it as a temple to Jupiter. So not a temple to the Jewish God, but a temple to Jupiter. Um, he also says that he has a lot of plans to redo the entire city. He's going to rebuild the whole city and he's going to rebuild it as a Roman city. So we still see legacies of that today. The fact that he installed a grid system 
Some of the streets in Jerusalem still run on this grid system. We also see that he built forums, there's a temple to Venus, and there's also a massive military camp. Um, and that is because the Jews did not respond well to Hadrian's offer to build a temple to Jupiter on their, you know, pretty much their most sacred site of the Temple Mount. So um, this led to a revolt called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. This was in 132 to 5 CE. Um, and although there was a lot of, um, of, of Jewish forces that rose up in this revolt, they were unfortunately unsuccessful. This is the, the third Jewish war uh, against the Romans that we have. And it led to the death, enslavement, and exile of many Jews, um, including from the city of Jerusalem. So after this, there are almost no Jews left in Jerusalem. The ones who are there might just be slaves. So they were actually exiled from the city, um, and it was renamed Aelia Capitolina by Hadrian, which is a reference to the Temple of Jupiter that he wanted to build there, the, the Capitoline, right? Um, so here we see, we see this depicted on coins. They, they created a mint there and started minting Roman coins in Jerusalem, which is now renamed. Um, and this, the first coin that they minted, this is the first, first edition of a coin um, from around 132. And it, it, it talks about the founding of the colony, Aelia Capitolina. Um, and you see Hadrian himself actually on this, um, this coin. And on the front, we have a depiction of Hadrian in profile. And then on the back, we have another depiction of Hadrian and he is dressed in the garb of a priest, a priest ruler. And he is uh, behind some oxen who are kind of plowing. So they're plowing in, in, the, in the sense that they're founding the new city, um, that they're building the city again. So um, although, you know, Hadrian, we consider him one of the five good emperors, we have to remember that that is a very Roman point of view, that for the enemies um, of Rome, you know, for people like the Jews, unfortunately, um, he was not one of the good emperors. They were exiled from Jerusalem and their city was, was rebuilt as a Roman city. So again, a very Roman focused view when we say the five good emperors. And we also see that with Trajan, you know, the fact that he took over Dacia. I'm not sure the Dacians would have thought he was one of the five good emperors, right? So it's all kind of subjective, the, the viewpoint that we see here. Um, and um, we'll continue to see, see issues playing out um, in Judea as well. Um, something else that we see, though, related to this um, are more depictions of Hadrian in this area. So this is a bronze caress portrait of Hadrian. Um, caress kind of refers, I, I've, I wish I'd introduced this earlier, um, but it's kind of when there's uh, someone wearing armor and the, the armor has a scene on it. So like the Augustus Prima Porta, the ones we saw of Trajan, these are all caress portraits. Um, so a bronze portrait, which is pretty rare. We don't usually have bronze portraits because uh, in later history, uh, bronze was often melted down. It was kind of a necessary resource. So uh, bronze items were often melted down and we don't have those anymore, but this one survived. We can immediately tell it's Hadrian. He's got the characteristic beard, very individualized, looks a lot like Hadrian. Also um, quite a lifelike depiction as well. Um, lots of naturalism here and um, a bit of realism as well. So um, we see kind of differences in, in the terms of bronze versus marble sculpting as well. There's I think a bit more detail you can do with bronze. Um, this was uh, found at the camp of the Sixth Roman Legion. So when the, the revolt happened, uh, the, the Romans created a kind of a military garrison that was stationed nearby, you know, because of lots of unrest. Um, and so this is a, a depiction of Hadrian uh, from that camp, but he's looking very militaristic. He's wearing armor. He, his arm might even be raised, although we don't have it, might be raised in sort of that ad locutio pose. Um, he might be addressing troops in a way. So again, a reference to Hadrian as a military commander and as the one who conquered this area yet again. Um, something else to note about the, the bronze uh, construction of it is that it is actually his whole head is casted from one piece of bronze. So that is really impressive as well. Um, definitely, a, definitely a skilled piece of work here. Something else that I just noticed is, you know, I was talking about the bronze and the way that you can use bronze to create these intricate details. Something else that we see on the face of Hadrian is carved pupils. So that's something we don't often see in, in marble statuary because in marble statuary, they would have painted the, the eyes to look like real eyes. But here we actually have them sculpted. So he looks maybe not as creepy as some of the, uh, the, the marble statues do when they don't have eyes anymore. <laughs> um, but they would have been painted back then, but this one was actually carved. So again, uh, differences between bronze and marble statuary. We're gonna move now to Lebanon. So this is, uh, Baalbek is the ancient name, although the Roman name is Heliopolis. 
Um, and this again is an, another ancient city that was taken over by the Romans. Uh, lots of great ruins that we see there today. It's a massive archeological site. And the, uh, the point of this one is the fact that we see a real blending of Roman and local influences, a real syncretism of Roman religion and local religion. And I've mentioned that a couple times, this phenomenon that uh, your, the city might have local deities or um, even regional deities, just these differences in religion when you have such a polytheistic religion the fact that all of these different gods can kind of be incorporated. Um, but in this case, actually, we do see um, a, a change. So in the sanctuary of Jupiter, um, it was actually originally a temple to Baal, who is uh, an Eastern god from that area. Um, and it was that way since the sixth century BC, but then the Romans come in and they rededicate it, rebuild it to Jupiter and they make an entire sanctuary as well. So um, we see sort of a courtyard, we see fountains, all of these things. Um, and then in the back there, we have the temple of Bacchus, which is a new construction. So in the one case, in the case of Jupiter, they're taking a temple that already existed and they're altering it into now worship for a Roman God. And in the temple of Bacchus, they're creating a new temple there. They're building it anew. So that's why the temple of Bacchus, second century, sanctuary of Jupiter, originally sixth century, updated in the first to be more Roman. Um, and just something else when we have these sites of such, um, with so many ruins left, um, we can really see their influence throughout time. So this is an illustration from someone in 1757 who visited the site. Um, and it's just so interesting how it looks kind of similar to how it does now. So especially this part of the world, very dry climate, kind of like in Egypt, um, there's not a ton of, of weather damage, things like that. So well preserved here. Moving now, once again, so that was Lebanon. We are now in Jordan in the city of Jerash. Uh, another um, Hellenistic city, so it was it especially flourished in the first um, half of the second century. Uh, Trajan came and built roads here, um, and that enables more people to visit. So when you build roads, you're necessarily going to have more people coming in and out of your city just because they can now. Um, so it starts to gain um, more kind of population, more, more visitors, more traction in um, the second century CE under Trajan. Uh, we also see that Hadrian visited in 129 and he built that uh, triumphal arch or that was built in his honor. So the one that we see here with its multiple arches. Um, it also is looking a little bit Eastern in the fact that we have a triangular pediment, but then we also have an arch. Um, so kind of simpler, sim similar to the temple of Hadrian maybe, although not as quite because this, this one, the arch doesn't go into the triangular pediment. The pediment is sitting on top, but slightly similar. Um, we also have engaged columns on the front. Uh, we have sort of these niches, which look like mini temples with their little uh, pediments and columns, uh, probably would have held statues. And then we see multiple bays here. So there's multiple ways that you can walk in. Um, and each one of these would be a bay. So this is a three, a three bayed arch. It's hard to see in this picture, but there is actually a, um, an, uh, there's actually a broken pediment. So we see um, sort of the beginnings of the pediment here when we have these triangular corners, but they're not finished. The finished one is behind that. So sort of two levels of pediments, although one of them is going to be a broken pediment. Um, and all in all, this is a very ornamental, very elaborately sculpted arch and definitely something that looks like something you would see in Jordan, not something that you would see in the center, center of Rome, um, but definitely something that is characteristic of the Eastern provinces, especially with that Assyrian and Eastern influence. Um, Jash also has uh, colonnaded streets, so another great example. We actually have a lot still standing today. So another example of uh, a province in the Eastern Roman Empire with these colonnaded streets. Uh, and they may have kind of created these, these porticos, these, these porches that you could walk through, and then there would be stands there. There would be shops lining these colonnaded streets. So kind of blending, in a way, the, the idea of a forum and a street that we're not separating those, that the street is kind of becoming the forum, it's becoming part of the marketplace. There would have also been a forum here, a, a formal one, um, but we're kind of extending that to, to exist along the street too. Um, and then we also have a well-preserved theater here with a pretty intact Scene fronds. So the fact that we are in the Eastern half of the empire, um, Greek theaters were a, a long mainstay of these cultures. And so we see lots of theaters here as well, just because that was part of the culture. 
Moving now to a different part of Jordan, one of my favorite places, Petra. Uh, Petra is a place with lots of dramatic architecture, dramatic rock cut architecture. And that's what we're seeing here. Again, the idea of experience. So um, I just wanted to start here because this is how you approach the building we're about to look at, is that you're coming through these, these really tall rock wall cliffs. Um, and it's gonna be very dark um, and you can't really see what's in front of you. And then you're gonna come out into the sunlight and you're going to see this elaborately sculpted uh, building set into the very cliffs that you were walking through. Um, so where there was once rock, you're now going to see this building um, in, in set into the cliffside. Um, so a very unique architecture that we don't see many other places. Um, it's very unique to this part of Jordan. Um, Jordan, or uh, sorry, Petra was established in the fourth century BC, also a Hellenistic city. So all of these having influences from Alexander the Great's travels um, being established shortly after by those of uh, his successors who, who came into the area after him. Um, it was the capital of the Nabataean kingdom and then that they were conquered by the Romans. Um, even before the Roman conquest though it was a wealthy trade city so definitely we see a lot of wealth here and as you may have noticed anytime there is wealth there is incredible architecture and incredible sculpture. Uh, this is perhaps the most famous of these rock cut buildings that we have. Um, there are more than one that exist, but this is sort of the most iconic al Kazna, which is the treasury. Uh, a bit of a misnomer there. So it was called the treasury because uh, Bedouins, when they came upon it, thought that treasure was hidden here, which I don't blame them because if I was in the desert and came up to something like this, I probably would also think it was a giant treasure chest. Um, and they actually thought that the the urn sort of that tholos at the top um that circular structure they thought that if they broke it it might explode with coins <laughs> so there's a, there was a little bit of damage from that because they they had shot at it thinking that maybe it would explode with coins um it is solid rock though it is not hollow so there's there's nothing inside don't try to break it open today please <laughs> um but it's actually so yeah it's not a treasury it is actually a tomb so this is a tomb for a specific individual um, it combines Roman and local elements, as you may have already noticed. So we again, um, like we just saw at Jerash in that, that triumphal arch, we see these, these niches um, in the upper levels that would have held statues. And in this case, they're actually not holding statues, they're holding relief images. So there's sculpted relief kind of taking the place of those sculptures that would be there. So we see that on the upper level. Like I said, we also see this round, almost Tholos-like um, uh, building in a way uh, at the top, and we also see a broken pediment. So like we saw on that triumphal arch at Jerash, we see this pediment that's almost a pediment. It's the beginnings of a pediment on the side, but it doesn't go all the way. So it's just going to stop right here, um, and then it's not going to have the, the actual peak of the pediment. And that's kind of just makes it more interesting because it, when you do that, you can frame another feature. So we have this tholos in the middle and then it's framed by this broken pediment. So it gives the impression of um, kind of traditional architecture, but we're, we're breaking it up. We're making it more interesting by adding another element there. And as you can see on the lower level, there is a traditional pediment uh, with a continuous frieze with Corinthian columns. So that's sort of a more traditional temple facade, although it's a tomb, it's not a temple, but a more traditional temple facade. And then up top, we're kind of putting a twist on the, the traditional Roman style, and we're making it a little bit more uh, local influence with the, the broken pediment and with those niches for statues. So again, the blending here of Roman and local design, um, and also a very wealthy trade city that they, they got their wealth from, from trade. Um, which is how many of these, these Eastern cities are, as you've probably noticed. One last thing to note about Petra is that it might look familiar to you. It's been used in many films as a, as a prominent film location, uh, perhaps most notably in the third Indiana Jones movie. Um, and when he's looking for the Holy Grail, they come to Petra. So a very iconic building in Jordan. So we're going to move now um, a little bit inland. So we were kind of um, on the coast here, we looked at Caesarea Maritima, uh, we looked at Jude Judea, Baalbek is here, you can see that as part of Lebanon, um, and then Petra, we went down here for a second. We're going to go inland a little bit, we're going to go to Palmyra. So this is Palmyra, it is located in modern day Syria, and a lot of different stuff that we're going to see here. So Palmyra is a city, and we'll talk about that as a city in a second, but outside of the city we see these tower tombs. 
So these are tombs. They would have held uh, dead individuals, as we say, on the uh, outskirts of the city. You know, we've talked about in Rome that people were not usually buried in the city. Uh, they were always on the outskirts. So that's what we see here. But in here, we see something kind of an iconic piece of architecture that's not common to the center of the empire in these tower tombs. And you can see that they were started in 9 BC and in continual use. So they were used for quite a bit of time. So let's look a little more closely at one of these tombs. So this is maybe one of the most famous, the Elabel Tower tomb. Um, and you can see it's it's quite blocky. So it, it's made with that ashlar masonry. So we have these cut stones that are being placed together to create a large building. We see this kind of balcony. So there's a bit of column, uh, relief columns, engaged columns with an arch. And then there's actually a little bit of a balcony, um, sort of maybe referencing the types of niches that we saw, like the ones in, in Petra. Um, so that's on the outside of it, a very sort of imposing, secure structure. Um, doesn't look like something that could be easily broken into, kind of looks almost fortress-like. Um, on the inside, though, we have these cubbies, essentially. <laughs> and these cubbies are each going to be decorated with a funerary relief to depict who is inside that tomb. Um, and so these are these are wall tombs. And so there wouldn't have just been one person buried in this structure, but you see a lot. It's almost more like a catacomb or something um, where we have multiple individuals buried in one place and they are marked by these relief sculptures. So some of these are really elaborately done. Um, we actually have a lot left there in, they're in museums all over the world. So um, there's a lot of work being done on these because they're uh, you know, often very individualized in a sense. So you get the sense that they are depicting a specific person. They are depicting the person who has died and they are often decorated with things that can tell us a lot about that person. So um, on the right here, we have a, a priest we know that his name was Marion from the inscription on the um, on the back there. So you can see some the symbols there, the, the letters there. Um, so we know his name and he is dressed as a priest. So uh, the traditional Palmyrian priestly garment, he has that round flat top um, on his hat. So that's, that's the hat that Palmyrian priests would wear. Um, among all of the funerary busts that we have, and I said we have a lot, you know, from these tombs because there was multiple tombs and then each tomb had multiple individuals in it. Um, we have almost 300 depictions of priests, um, but the inscriptions don't necessarily tell us that these are priests. So we're getting that from their, um, from their portraiture, from the, the iconography that they're wearing. Um, also, the priests were uh, not necessarily that their whole life was being a priest. This is kind of an honorary title bestowed on someone. So it would often be a member of a group of officials who would oversee festivals, the upkeep of a temple. They're almost more like a civic official in that sense, um, but they are a priest related to religion. Um, but there's also a connection there with politics that they're kind of closely intertwined. Um, and we also see again that they are, uh, this is a, an honorary title often bestowed upon someone. So the fact that this person is being depicted as a priest um, for the, the portrait on their tomb, you know, again represents this, this idea that this is an honor they were bestowed with. So they want to represent themselves as that even after they have died, this is something they're very proud of being is this, this honor. Um, on the left here, we see one of the most famous Palmyrian portraits. This is the so-called Beauty of Palmyra. Um, and this is also one of those funerary busts. So um, what, what do we see here? We see a lot of jewelry. That should probably clue you in right away, right? Um, it's very lavish. Uh, the depictions of the jewelry here um, even still have coloring on them. So you can see that gold color. Uh, and that's actually, some of it is gold leaf. So very lavish material, wealthy material as well. Uh, the jewelry is very detailed. Uh, there are seven necklaces on the bust and they are all different. So all of these are different necklaces designed differently. Um, and the headgear as well, we see multiple uh, le levels of headgear going on and they're all different and they're all very detailed. I mean, if you just look at each one of these sort of hanging pieces um, and then central, the central motifs as well, the, the intricacy that one would need to, to carve these um, was very great. Um, so definitely an elite grave, definitely a member of the upper echelons of society. Um, and also, uh, although it no longer exists, the eyes probably would have been inset with glass. Um, so that also would have been another kind of luxurious piece of this portrait, um, another high quality material in some kind of glass. So um, definitely um, characteristic of Palmyra. 
and the fact that there are wealthy, high prominent individuals in society um, that can commission these, these great portraits of themselves um, or their families can commission them after they have died. Um, and also a lot of, of influence from the local area. So this priest, for instance, is not necessarily the same type of priest that you would see in the middle of Rome. This is a very Palmyrin uh, priest that relates to the religion of that locale. So if we turn a little bit more now to the city, um, you'll see that the tombs are kind of all scattered outside of the city on the outskirts, as I said, and then this is the center of the city of Palmyra. Uh, so the first thing we should notice are those colonnaded streets, right? So um, we see lots of examples of this, very characteristic of the Eastern Roman Empire, as I've said many times, this colonnaded street, and it usually would be the main street going through the city that would have this colonnade on it. Um, and we also see, uh, you can see kind of in the middle here, uh, this arch. So this is an arch of Septimius Severus, who we haven't gotten to yet. So as I said, in this lecture, we're skipping around all different eras. So Septimius Severus is an emperor we'll get to later. Um, but this was a triumphal arch built in honor of him. It marks an entrance to this colonnaded street, and it also would have provided some kind of shade. So we are in a very hot part of the world. We're out in the desert. So you want some kind of shaded structure. And that's another thing, you know, I mentioned the colonnaded streets would have a portico. So they would have this, this porch kind of walkway lining the street um, as like a sidewalk in a way also, and that would have been shaded. So definitely important to implement shaded um, walkways, shaded spaces in the, the common areas of the city. Um, so this triumphal arch would have provided some of that shade um, dedicated to an emperor, um, as we've seen, you know, uh, that it might not necessarily be imperial construction. It wasn't Septimius Severus coming here and building this, but it was likely the local people building it in honor of him. And we see a lot of those same hallmarks of Eastern triumphal arch style in that it may have even had a pediment on top and then it would have had that arch as well. Um, and that we're, we're, we don't have much of the top of it, but um, likely would have held maybe some niches for statues similar to the, um, the triumphal arch that we saw at Jerash. Um, unfortunately for us today, this arch no longer exists. So um, if you go to Palmyra today, much of what I'm showing you is no longer there because in 2015, ISIS came into the city and destroyed many, many of the remains, which as you saw in that first image, there were many, many remains, lots of standing architecture. Um, unfortunately, that does not exist as of 2015. So you can see here, this is the site we were just looking at where that arch of Septimius Severus would have been. And uh, there are just a few columns left. The arch itself no longer exists. Um, we see this all over Palmyra. So there was a temple here, a temple of Bell. Um, it would have originally combined Roman influence with local influence, as we've seen, Corinthian columns on it. Um, would have been kind of an interesting, an interesting uh, 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 temple characteristic of of this locale, um, so a very unique structure, um, unfortunately no longer exists either, just this, this one archway is on, only the thing that's left, also destroyed by ISIS. Uh, moving on, we have the Temple of Baal Shamin. Uh, you can see that the, the front columns here still survive, but that whole structure in the back was destroyed. Um, and the, actually the, temper, the tomb that we were looking at earlier, so that tomb of Elabel um, is also no longer standing. So that was an old photograph um, we, we have gone in there since, um, but this, these were taken sh very shortly after the destruction in 2015, um, and we can see that they were blown up by ISIS. I believe this one is the one here because you can tell by that uh, little balcony and it no longer exists today. So um, these sites, you know, sometimes we think of them as, as being very static in time, that uh, they have existed unpreserved, you know, pres perfectly preserved and untouched since the Roman period, but even historic sites like this um, even archaeological sites are still part of our world today. They're part of our ever-changing history. Um, they're, they're still having things happen to them in their own history. Their stories are still being written in a way. And I'm not sure there's ever a way that we can talk about Palmyra and not talk about what happened here with ISIS, not talk about the destruction that happened. Um, so it's an ever-evolving site, um, although it, 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 its history may feel like it's over. It's still unfolding. Um, there is architecture that does still stand. Um, so this, this is the theater there. Um, much, much of it was not destroyed. We can see that the top of the, the uh, kind of skinny fronds here, this pediment no longer exists, um, but we do have other um, memories of it, unfortunately, and that a video came out of ISIS uh, conducting executions in the center of this, of this theater. 
So again, these sites are not static. They are ever changing. Um, their histories are still being written. And sometimes those histories are quite tragic for um, people in the area, for, for the architecture itself, for this cultural resource. Um, this was something that was on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and we see how much destruction has happened. So there are many plans to rebuild uh, the, the government and uh, multiple governments have, have said that they hope to help to pitch in to rebuild it, especially because so much of the um, so much of the material is still in place. So the rubble is still there. So they might even be able to use the same material and maybe build it up again. But um, again, like I said, I'm just not sure you can ever think of Palmyra the same way without thinking of the destruction that took place there. Um, so we are going to move now on. So that was the Levant area. Um, that was kind of uh, the this area here, as you can see on the map. Um, and we're now coming into Egypt. So this will be the last place that we look at for today. Um, and then we'll continue our look at the provinces next time as well. So we're going to look at Egypt. And because we've looked so much, I feel like, at um, at city layout, at urban layout, at cities. I hope you know those colonnaded streets by now. Um, we're not going to look too much at that this time. We're going to be looking more at portraiture. And perhaps the most famous uh, portraits to come out of Roman Egypt are the Fayum portraits. Um, so these also, like the Palmyrian portraits that were found in those tower tombs, we have many, many examples of. They're in museums all over the world now. Um, the closest ones to us are probably at the Getty in Los Angeles. They have a few there. So if you're ever there, go check them out. Um, but these also date from the Roman period. So they were kind of uh, painted over a long period of time, over a few centuries. Um, and these are a great look into um, individualized style uh, at the time. So these are all um, uh, mummy portraits. So as you can see on the left, it would have been um, placed on the head of a mummy. So when they are wrapped up, the, this painting would have been put on that. So these are panel paintings. They're not wall paintings. They're not frescoes, which are done on a wall. These are panel paintings. So they would have been done on kind of like a wooden tablet. And then that wooden tablet would have been placed on the uh, mummy. Also a note, like I've been saying, the fact that Egypt is very dry means that we have these really well preserved. So that's why the colors are still bright. Um, all of these things is because like the mummies that we have even from thousands of years before the Romans, um, Egypt is a, a great place to preserve um, uh, materials because it's so dry there that nothing gets damaged very easily. So we're gonna look at a few of these um, in specific detail. Before we do that, I just wanna point out the stylistic similarities that we see in all of them. So even though each one doesn't look similar, they are individualized, they're clearly depicting one person, the person who is that mummy, um, we see similarities in the way that they are painted. So we see these big eyes in all of them, right? Um, we see the, they're almost exaggerated, the way that these eyes are so rounded and are so kind of bulging out of the face. Um, and we see this across time too. So it almost looks like these all could have been painted by the same artist, but we know that's not the case because they were painted over centuries. Um, but we see the same stylistic practices that are very characteristic of this region. Um, so they, they definitely share similarities there, even though they are individualized um, looks at people. So uh, let's look at a couple of these in more detail. So this is the mummy portrait of a young woman from Hawara. Uh, it is from 110 to 120. So that's a little bit early in the Fayum portrait world. Um, and again, we can see a very individualized look at this woman. Um, we see uh, very, very clear brush strokes. So it's very evident the painting technique here. Uh, we can really see the hand of the artist in this work. The fact that these, these brush strokes are so evident that they're not blended in to create a flat surface, it's very textured. You can see, again, the brush strokes. Um, and this is something that I wanna point out in the fact that it is painted with encaustic on wood. So encaustic on wood, um, encaustic is a wax-based translucent paint and it, it does make things look more realistic. If you want a more realistic, naturalistic depiction of someone, encaustic is a good way to go because the properties of the paint lend themselves to more realistic skin tone, things like that. So um, encaustic on wood is definitely one of the reasons that these are able to look so so individualized and so realistic to the sense that they are. Um, in this woman, we also see a, a, a kind of Flavian-esque hairstyle. So um, not quite because this is a little bit after the fact, this is 110, um, but you'll remember that Trajan's wife also kind of had that that high hairstyle, that coif. And so we're seeing that as well. So we see these trends from, from Rome, from the Empress, um, being translated all the way to Egypt and people kind of adopting similar hairstyles. So we see definite trends across the empire. 
Um, we also see a lot of jewelry on this woman and similar to the Palmyran portrait, uh, each one is different. So we, we see a different strand for each necklace. Uh, we see these, these elaborate earrings um, kind of actually matching mine, I just noticed. <laughs> uh, so some things never change. And we see that she is gazing off to the side. She is sort of looking out and her eyes almost feel a little bit unfocused and that she's just kind of looking out almost seeming to kind of look at nothing. She's just kind of gazing. And um, this might be a reference to the fact that this is someone who has died. And so she, she's sort of looking out into the afterlife, looking out um, into the unknown. She's not making that eye contact with you because she's not alive anymore. She's not with you. She's sort of passed on. And so she's, she's looking to the side. Um, here's another one though, um, and these are a bit different because these are um, later and these we do see very confident eye contact. Um, and so that might be a little bit of a development that we see and that now they're really starting to speak to us. Like you feel like these women are looking right at you, right in the eye. Um, the one that I'm mostly going to be focusing on is the one on the left. So that is the Fayum portrait of an Antonine woman from Philadelphia. Um, Antonine refers to the dynasty that we're going to get to next. Um, and Philadelphia, not the Philadelphia that you think of. So this is Philadelphia, Egypt, um, which is where our Philadelphia gets its name. Um, but in this woman, uh, we see again, similar to the woman that we saw earlier, that she looks very wealthy. This must be an elite woman because she has, uh, you know, earrings, she has an elaborate necklace. She even has a sort of gold laurel crown that she's wearing. Um, and also her clothing as well. We see different colors of clothing. Um, so definitely an elite woman in society. Um, and that makes sense because if you're going to commission a portrait like this, you probably have money. Um, and the better the portrait, probably the more money you have. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty good portrait there. Um, but just to show you, we see all types of individualization. So different jewelry, we don't often see the same jewelry twice. So it's almost like this is really what this person owned. This is really her favorite necklace that she decided to, to, to depict. Um, so again, though, we see those big eyes, those big kind of um, bulging eyes that are really the focus of it. And in these ones especially really draw you in where um, in this one, you, the eyes I feel like are still the, the focus of the portrait, um, but they're not connecting with you as the viewer. Um, but in this one, they really are. So a bit of a difference there. Um, moving on to look at some, some male portraits. So this is a portrait of a priest of Serapis who we talked about at Hadrian's Villa, right? He had the Serapeum, which was um, that, that sanctuary, that worship um, center in Egypt to Serapis that Hadrian recreated at his villa. So this is a, a priest of that cult of Serapis. Um, and we can tell that he's a priest because of the head, headdress that he wears. So that headband and then the fact that he has three curls coming down. Do you see that? One, two, three, like that. And in other men, we don't see that. We just see these curly mops of hair. Um, but here we see three kind of distinct curls. And that is a sign of the cult of Serapis, people who had that. We see this in, in other images as well. Um, that denotes them as a priest of Serapis, kind of like in the Palmyran portrait, the fact that he had that flat topped hat. Uh, similar thing here. It's a way to denote someone as, as, religious, uh, as a religious member. We also see them here with beards. All three men are bearded, um, which I think I've said before, always prior to Hadrian adopting it, um, was kind of a mark of someone who is not from Rome. Um, so perhaps in Egypt, you know, they're not as, as beholden to Roman conventions, but we also see that this is after Hadrian. So once Hadrian comes into power and starts depicting himself with a beard, we see it be a lot more popular in society. So I'm not sure which one that is here, um, but definitely all these men have beards. Uh, so it must have been the trend at the time. Moving now, this is um, another portrait. And this one we actually know the name of because uh, it is inscribed. So we have some writing on it. You can see that right here. Um, and it tells us who it is. And it tells us also that he's a, free, a freed man. So um, he was maybe a slave before and has since been freed. Um, he does look quite young. So this is probably a, a boy. And we see something that I haven't necessarily talked about yet, but we see in a lot of the other portraits is this use of contrast. So the fact that the, the background is wood and you can actually see the wood panel, right? And then they've painted the background a lighter color and that really contrasts with his dark hair and his tan skin. So we have a contrast between him and the background. Um, and then also he has these white robes on, which are also a big contrast with his skin tone and also less of a contrast with the background, um, but there's still definitely some lines there, some shadowing you can see here, definite shadowing 
um, to, to, to make that those lines more defined, to create a sense of depth that he's sitting closer to us. And whatever that white part is, um, is kind of a background. That's maybe the wall he's sitting in front of. Um, he is also looking off to the side. So he, well, he's not making direct eye contact with you, maybe gazing into the afterlife, something like that. Um, and there's also, we see here, speaking of those shadows, to go back to that, um, we see a definite light source. So the fact that he is looking out into that direction and you can actually kind of see on his eyes, these little white bits. And then this half of his face is definitely illuminated. We can really see, it looks like he's got some great highlighter on. Um, we can see that under his eye um, and on his forehead that there's this ray of light shining here. And then this side of his face is much darker. And like I said, we see even that shadow that's being cast underneath his chin. So you can see exactly where that light source is coming in and it's causing shadows underneath his chin and on his shoulder. So um, that also can kind of create um, a sense of depth in a way and that we have different layers here that we have a light source and then we have him and then we have a background. So um, different painting techniques we're seeing here. And I wanna contrast this one. So this is, uh, 190 CE, 190, portrait of a, a young boy. I want to contrast that with something that we see a little bit later in 200 to 250. So this is also a young boy, but the style is very different. There are some similarities, so they're not totally different because this one still has those big kind of bulging eyes. Um, but there's definitely, there's no sense of a light source here. The depth is not as expertly done. So it looks much more like they're blending into the background than that he's standing out from the background. This we can really tell because of that use of shadow and contrast where the background is and where he is. And this one, it's a much uh, less defined line. There's not as much contrast. So this one is much more abstracted. If this one is going to be more naturalistic, this one's going to be much more abstracted. So we're ta back to that talking about portraits here. And that's kind of interesting because this is actually later in time. And for centuries, we've been seeing, you know, lots of portraits that look fairly naturalistic, um, maybe a little bit more abstract in this one. But once we've gotten into the late second century, we're really seeing depth. And here we see a bit more abstraction. And that has to do with the material. So if you look at the material, those were all encaustic on wood. And I said that that's kind of a translucent, a lucent paint. Um, it's really good for painting human figures because it can kind of capture the, the complexity of our skin. Uh, but this one is tempera, which, which just necessarily creates more abstracted figures. It's not as uh, realistic when it comes to uh, depicting humans. Um, so we see a much more rounded and abstract depiction here, much more flat, less depth. We also see a difference in the colors. So we see much more primary colors here, a much more muted palette compared to the really the warmth and the contrast here, much more muted, um, but also more of a singular color palette. Um, in terms of, of iconography, we see that this is a young boy. So although he may look um, a little feminine to us now, uh, his clothing, his hairstyle, these are all things that boys would have looked like, um, things that would have denoted boys in, in Egypt. Um, we see him holding flowers as well. So um, he holds a cup in his right hand and in his left hand, he holds a garland made of flowers with strings. So they're, they're, string, they're flowers that have been strung together. Um, the cup that he's holding is blue glass and it's probably holding red wine. And that is a sign of um, the fact that this is a death portrait, the fact that this is going to be on a mummy because wine was an offering to the dead. You would, you would pour out a libation of wine or you would put it in a ceramic vase um, as, a, as, a, as a gift to the dead, as, a, um, as I said, an offering to the dead. Um, and the flowers, similarly, the flowers um, are a sign of rebirth. So flowers die every year and then come back to life with the seasons, with the changing seasons. And so they're a sign of rebirth in Egyptian culture. So the fact that we have wine symbolizing death and then flowers symbolizing rebirth. So these are, this is a dual message that we're sending on the mummy. And if you know anything about Egyptian religion, you know that the idea of the afterlife as another life truly another life that you there you know they're often buried with things that you would need in the next life um there was definitely a definite sense of this of of passing on but the life has not ended so uh the fact that he is holding these flowers is a representation that he will be reborn now um but again i want to emphasize the 
much more abstracted style that we see here. And it is not a, a commentary on, on how advanced one artist is or the other. Um, but we see that because they're using tempera, it's a bit more difficult. Um, and also later in time, we just see these styles changing. However, there are still stylistic similarities. As I said, the big rounded eyes don't change. There's still that same sort of rounded bulgingness to them. So these are the Fayum portraits. Um, there's a million more that I could show you, but we'd be here all day. Um, so if you're interested, there, there are many more online um, and you can look them up. I know the Getty Villa has some, so you could look them up there if you're interested. So that's why I do it for us. Um, just to kind of recap, so we spent a lot of time in Rome and then today we came down to, uh, to Greece. So we came to Athens over here. Um, and then we went over to Asia Minor. We saw some cities on the coast like Ephesus, Sagalossus. And we started coming down into the Levant, into the Arabian Peninsula. We looked at Syria, Judea, Lebanon, Jordan. Then we ended here in Egypt, looking at those Fayum portraits. And we're gonna continue moving. So next time we're gonna start with North Africa. We're gonna be looking over here at colonies in North Africa. And then we'll continue up into Western Europe. And we'll be looking at the Western provinces uh, in Europe here. And that will round us out. That'll bring us back to Rome. So we're done halfway done with the provinces. But as you can see, there is just so much. There's so many cities that were built up by the Romans that the Romans made their mark in. And when you have an empire of this size, it's impossible to cover everything in this class. So that's a bit of an overview. Um, but I encourage you to do more research on your own, look into more provinces if you're interested, because there really are so many interesting ones out there. So thank you very much and see you next time for the Western provinces.